Hey everyone, Pastor George here, and I am going to do something unprecedented for these theologues, and I am going to combine today and tomorrow's into one Wong one. So you're getting two theologues for the price of one. Um, and so, Culture Thursday, Mailbag Friday, and uh, yeah, so let's, let's dive into it. So, I, I am kind of sad today for what I have to talk about on Culture Thursday, because as you know, several months ago I talked about Ravi Zacharias, who is a very famous apologist and incredibly um, talented person when it came to debating and uh, leading people um, logically uh, to God, right? Well, it turns out that he did some incredibly unsavory things in his personal life. Now, allegations were made like three years ago or something like that, but it ultimately ended with nothing really coming of it. Um, and it kind of was just, you know, forgotten about. Well, it turns out that his ministry, after he had passed away, had entered into a contract with this legal authority in uh, Georgia, kind of like a private investigator type thing, to go through everything and really see if there's anything there. And it turns out that, yeah, there there is, and there's there's a lot of really unsavory things that, that he did. And it's really, of course, sad, because obviously if this guy is so important and he, it, it would, for, for me, it would be like Tim Keller doing something like this. For a lot of people, Robbie Zacharias is, is someone who they really looked up to. Um, and of course, like uh, if, if someone you really look up to, especially in the faith, does this, right? Pastoral authorities, people who are gifted, um, people who are able to lead these really double lives, right? And on the outside seem really holy or, or put together and, and the inside just be complete, um, you know, and total sinners, uh, to put it in, in very, uh, you know, clean language. Um, and it's really, really sad. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I think it's good that the ministry is going through with this and trying to figure out like who was wronged and they're not trying to sweep it under the rug, which, which is great. Um, and of course we should be praying for, uh, everyone who is kind of involved in the situation, the victims, the, you know, people who, uh, it kind of what I would consider to be the secondary or, or, third order victims, which are people that really looked up to him and were kind of wide. But I also want to talk about like what this means about Christian ministry in general and like Christian Christians and how we should view our leaders. Right. And I'm not just saying this to cover myself for whatever, um, you know, future thing, not saying there is going to be anything, but you know, not, not trying to be all cynical or whatever. Everyone's cynical today. Um, but I am, I am speaking honestly here, which is that we can't, you can't see me. You can't see other pastors as people who are being, extremely holy, right? We are a faith that says that everyone is a sinner. Um, I think one of the things we tend to do is we can tend to become idolizers of people uh, and we can end up, you know, becoming a Christian mainly for them or for other things rather than trusting in Jesus as the person who can wash us free from sin, right? And the thing that, um, that I've seen, I guess, is that we... Uh, definitely uh, believe that, you know, people who are in these positions of authority are holier than everyone else or somehow less susceptible, which isn't true at all. I mean, in, in fact, I, you know, I'm a big believer, it, you know, power corrupts. And so I can totally see these people who get all of these uh, privileges and all this power totally abusing it. Right. Um, and that doesn't matter any whatever, you know, wherever you come from, no matter what your theology, no matter what your politics, everyone does that. Um, different ways for different people, but everyone tries to take advantage of, of the situation when they have the power and they think they can get away with it, right? Because that's our sinful and corrupt hearts is we ultimately think we can get away with these things. And then of course, uh, they will eventually come to light. Um, it's unfortunate that uh, he never repented of these things, but that is uh, you know, out of our, out of our control completely. Um, but hopefully his ministry will go through the right steps to actually correct some of these injustices that happened. I'm hoping, um, that they do that anyway. And, and it seems like many people within the organization, uh, other apologists associated with it and stuff like that have, have really done a great job with that. And obviously, um, the, the another good thing is the, the ministry is making all of their findings public. To people, um, the reason this just broke is because they released like a mid, mid investigation, you know, um, update, 
and they basically confirmed that a lot of the things that people were accusing him of were, were true, or at least some of them were true. Uh, and so uh, it'll be interesting to see when, what happens when the full report drops sometime in, in January, February. But it really, it, it is just something, you know, you can't, you know, don't put your trust in princes, right? Do not put your trust in spiritual princes or in, uh, you know, physical princes. And I also want to, you know, secular princes. I also do want to say that, you know, as, as much as, it, it, of course, this looks terrible for the Christian faith when any, whenever someone prominent like this does this. But I always contend myself with knowing that for every person that becomes famous doing something evil like this, um, is there's also hundreds of faithful people, faithful pastors that go their entire career um, running the good good race, right? And and those people always get over overshadowed. Um, not saying they're perfect either; they're not, uh, but they're clearly not making these same egregious mistakes that uh, others do. So I just wanted to, to talk about that uh, for the first part for my Culture Thursday thing uh, today. Um, maybe I'll have more thoughts about it when it when it finally comes out in February, but who knows. Uh, so in uh, in for my mailbag Friday, what I wanted to talk about was uh, I was going to mailbag myself, right? And I asked um, kind of a question last week, is which is one that we often hear which is, what is, is Christmas a pagan holiday, right? You'll hear it all the time. Christmas is actually a pagan holiday. Don't you know that, you stupid Christian? When you're celebrating Christmas, you're really celebrating Horus, or you're really celebrating uh, Mithras, or you're really celebrating Odin, or whatever. Odin is Santa Claus, all that type of stuff, right? All right, firstly, historically, all of that is, is incorrect. So let me give you the whole history of Christmas and celebrations in December from Roman times to now, and I'm going to do my best to contend with each of the things I just said. So, um, Christmas, December 25th. You've commonly probably heard that it is it was set by the church on the same day that uh, the the festival to Sol Invictus or to Mithras uh, was made, right? Um, and, and that was the church's try to, to lure pagans into worshiping, right? False. The reason that the tw December 25th is the day that we celebrate the birth of Jesus is because the church argued that Jesus had it was perfect, right? And by perfect, it means perfect in every way. So how long was his pregnancy? It was the exactly nine months in length. And when was Jesus's, uh, you know, birth conceived of, of happening at? Well, uh, or um, death uh, conceived, right? Um, well, nine months in length. And so if you take the uh, what is kind of considered to be the renewal of the world, like Easter, right, which is kind of like the culmination of who Jesus is uh, and what his time time is. And the church said, and early rabbis also kind of had this idea that the Passover had happened in March, right? Third, uh, three twenty-five, right? Perfect birth, perfect gestation gestation period, perfect trimesters, right? All the way perfect, nine months, bam, you hit December 25th, right? And of course, people are going to say, well, that's kind of convenient, isn't it? Isn't that like around the other pagan holidays? Well, I guess in the sense that there were holidays kind of all the time, we could say that if it happened in July, people, Christians were trying to co-opt the, um, uh, the uh, celebration of July 4th or whatever, you know. Uh, the point is, is that these sometimes these things do line up. And of course, there is, uh, you know, spiritual things of a renewing of the world, right? The, the coldest time of the year, the deadest night or whatever, that we celebrate um, Christ's birth and things like that to bring light to the nations. Um, and of course, so it doesn't happen uh, on December 25th for any other reason than it was nine months from March 25th, right? So there, there you go. Uh, now, there are other pagan holidays around it, and people will claim that some of these inventions or things that we attach to Christmas come from them, and it depends which which ones you're talking about. But some people will, will you know, say it's like Saturnalia, which is a Roman holiday, but that's not really true um, because we don't really know how they celebrated Saturnalia with, with like great clarity. And we certainly know that a lot of the things that define Christmas today are not things that the Romans defined their festival with in that time of year. Um, and we also don't know when these other supposed holidays were supposed to happen, like Sol Invictus or, or Mithras. The only, uh, the only evidence we have for those comes from the 1400s 
and they that's a claim that it happened on the 25th. Uh, and it's actually a claim by a, a Eastern Orthodox bishop against the Western Church. Because you have to remember, people who are Eastern Orthodox used to celebrate Christmas like two or three weeks after us because they used a, a different calendar. Um, and so they said that, oh, the Western Church is you know, so perverse that they used a pagan holiday to make Christmas when really our, our calendar is better, right? That's actually where the claim comes from. It's really funny when you see like a lot of the claims that people make about Christianity are actually Christians disparaging other Christians for thinking things differently than them and attaching these, these weird concepts to things, uh, which is really funny. Um, the only thing that's probably actually pagan uh, that is in our normal Christmas celebrations is the Christmas tree in the sense that it's probably attached to some sort of Germanic, you know, festival thing that happened around Yule, right, which is a Germanic uh, festival at this time of year. Um, but besides that, it, there really isn't that much about Christian, Christmas. It's pagan. Um, and so, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that you'll hear about that it's not true. Uh, Christmas is a pretty Christian holiday. Uh, just because it happened to fall around some other ones doesn't make it actually pagan. Um, you know, correlation does not equal causation, right? All right, so there's my answer to that. Um, I hope you guys have a wonderful Christmas. Merry Christmas. I'll see you guys on our virtual service tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Um, it's a bummer that the weather didn't work with us, but that's that's how, you know, that's how it goes. That's how the cookie crumbles sometimes, but I'm still looking forward to it. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful Christmas Eve and a Merry Christmas. Peace out.